I'm just going to turn on the recording and all right. There we go. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you're having a lovely afternoon. My name is Jacqueline Coaches, and I am proud to say that I am the chapter's executive director. Uh, the Michigan Paralyzed Veterans of America has been around for over 60 years. We service the entire state of Michigan. Our members are made up of veterans with spinal cord injury or disease, but we also have associate members, and those individuals can be anyone that has stake in our organization. You pay a one-time $50 fee, and you get all the benefits of being one of our members, um, besides uh, the opportunity to have uh, voting rights, as, as our life members do. Um, but I don't want to spend too much time on that. Um, you can always visit our website or contact me um, to find out more information. Um, I will, um, there will be a screen that provides our contact information on this slide. Um, but I'm going to introduce our speaker in, a, in just one moment, but I want to let everyone know that this presentation is being recorded today. We will be sharing it on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page, and we'll also be sending you an email um, with a link to view it as well. So if you miss anything, mm -hmm. you can always go back um, and, and check it out. Um, at this time, I would like to ask that you please mute your microphones and save your questions until the end of the presentation. Um, we will have an opportunity at that point to allow for questions, and you can either uh, use the raise hand tool or you can type it in the chat box. Um, but without further ado, I want to go ahead and hand it off to our awesome speaker today, Brandon Grisco from the Fasan Bond Attorneys at Law. Brandon will be talking to us today about estate planning, a topic that um, I know from doing the run through of this presentation, we can all truly benefit from learning more about. Um, Brandon, the floor is yours and just give me a shout whenever you want me to change the next slide. Okay, I'll I'll try and make it obvious uh, without without having to say next slide every time. But uh, if not, I'll let you know. Uh, hey, everybody, I'm I'm Brandon Grisco, partner over here at Fossil and Bond uh, Law Firm in Western Wayne County. We have clients throughout the state of Michigan. Uh, Jacqueline, if you could just if I'm going too fast, uh, if I'm talking too much, which I have a tendency to do, uh, just jump in and let me know. One of the advantages to doing this on Zoom is Jacqueline can't hit me with a stick. Uh, because we're <laughs> not in the same office, so never. Uh, yeah, I I'm sure. Never. Now, well, you've not you've not heard me just ramble on. Uh, I'm sure some judges wish they could wish they could whack me too. So, um, but anyway, uh, pretty much your standard legal disclaimer here. I won't spend a lot of time on that, but you just got to understand that although this is a presentation, it's been prepared with the best available information. Um, there's no substitute for individual attorney-client relationship and uh, attention to your individual circumstances. So we'll just blow right past that one. Um, I've been doing estate planning now for a number of years and, uh, you know, what is estate planning? Uh, because you hear a lot, you hear a lot of different things in relation to that. So I do estate planning work, probate work, uh, trust work. These are things that all kind of fall, uh, within the ambit of areas that touch on estate planning. And so I think, you know, the most common thing that folks might say, uh, with regards to estate planning is that it's okay. What happens with my stuff when I pass away? All right. I think that's the most common thing that people think about. And maybe not so much, although equally or more importantly, is, well, what if I just need help with my decision making or managing my property and affairs, but I'm unavailable or disabled or something to that effect? And so I think a lot of people don't necessarily think about the lifetime uh, implications of I'm still alive. But for whatever reason, I need somebody to step in and help me out. Uh, that's the component. Uh, we're going to talk about both of those things. But that's the component I think often gets overlooked. But I try to bring those together. And I think most uh, attorneys that practice in this space try to bring those things together kind of holistically uh, to develop something that's unique and, and right for your uh, particular situation. So that's kind of the big picture. What is estate planning? And here's some common myths about estate planning uh, versus what's the reality of estate planning. I'm trying to move my, okay, there we go. And uh, 
you know, it's just for the top 1%. I think back in the 1990s when there was pretty significantly different uh, estate tax laws, you know, um, you, you maybe had to pay estate tax on transfers in excess of 250000 or something like that. Uh, now that number is like $12 million. So, you know, a lot less people are paying estate tax, but that doesn't necessarily equate to less people need estate planning, right? There's something for everybody. Everybody could use a power of attorney for decision-making assistance when they become incapacitated. Everybody needs at least a basic will, right? Everybody needs somebody to walk through their beneficiary designations with them. These, th th this is stuff that's out there for everyone, uh, not just for that top 1%. Now, we already, we already covered the second one, right? That it's only about what happens to my stuff when I die. But there's different quality of life issues and who's going to manage your assets and affairs and who's going to make decisions for you. You know, if you have a slip and fall and you end up in a coma, who has the authority to sue the property owner to the extent there was some negligence, right? These are things that are not covered uh, in the absence of sort of a, an estate plan. Um, and then I think there's sort of a common, uh, hey, well, you know, it's going to all end up at my spouse and then my kids if my spouse is dead, right? You know, well, no, <laughs> not necessarily. Uh, Michigan law has a very specific way that things occur if you if you die uh, with no will, no trust, and uh, potentially no beneficiary designation. So there's tons of factors that are going to play into that. Uh, at, at the federal law level, um, which doesn't play into it too, too much, but you have ERISA, um, which governs like 401k plans and, and other sorts of benefit plans like that. Uh, those laws are going to play into it. And then state law about what happens with, with stuff that passes intestate or without a will, um, that law would play into it too. And uh, unfortunately, it's not as simple as you might think that, you know, hey, 100% of this is going to go to my spouse. And then if, if, if my spouse has passed, then it's all going to go to my kids. Well, Michigan law actually provides for typically a chunk uh, of the estate that would go to the spouse with the remainder going to the kids. Um, you know, and that's not necessarily the way that I find that most of my clients would let things done. Listen. So, you know, the myth, the myth is that it's going to all end up where you want it, but the reality is that that's not the case. So uh, let's go ahead and jump into the next one there. Um, this is something that I really noticed uh, with COVID is that COVID. people didn't know that it was going to be too late, right, to, to do the planning. People didn't know that this COVID thing was going to happen and that they were gonna suddenly uh, go be in a nursing home totally restricted on visitors. And I, and I said this, I think Jacqueline and uh, Michael can attest to it during the pre, uh, the dry run that we did a week ago or so. Um, you know, I got a lot of calls during COVID about, hey, guardianship, conservatorship, mom, dad's in the nursing home, da 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 da. Well, you know, I, I was calling up nursing homes and begging them to come and let me see clients and and sign these documents and we couldn't do that. And so a lot of people had to wait on the courts to approve guardianships and conservatorships and things like that. Um, and a lot of the people that were affected by this were unable to communicate very well virtually due to uh, technology issues and advanced age and advanced stages of illness and things like that. So although they were mentally competent to be able to do these documents, uh, they weren't tech savvy enough and the facilities weren't accommodating enough to allow me to get in there and do what I had to do. Um, and, and so, hey, we might be saying, okay, well, COVID's over with, that's never going to happen again. I don't know if that's true, but, you know, those types of things. But you, you, there's a personal, your personal pandemic, right? Something could happen to you that could essentially create the same type of situation, right? Maybe you're trapped out of state somewhere, uh, stuck out of the country somewhere, or maybe you just uh, have waited now and you're in a coma or something, or car accident, whatever has happened, or on uh, early onset dementia or something like that has occurred. And now, for whatever reason, there's this personal emergency and just not enough time to get it done. So uh, this all just kind of highlights to me the importance of doing this stuff well in advance. You know, now during periods of health or lucidity, that's the time to get this stuff done, not, you know, as the emergency begins to present itself on the horizon. So uh, get it done, do it now. Uh, you know, these are all... I think, oh, I guess to, to me, to an attorney that practices in this area, it seems fairly obvious that, you know, you could go on the Michigan uh, state website and print out what they have there for a statutory will and fill in those blanks on that document. You could go to a legal Zoom sort of platform and plug in some information about yourself 
and, and it spits you out a document uh, that would be a legally binding valid uh, will, for example. Um, there's different websites for powers of attorney and stuff like that too. Uh, but because you don't know what you don't know, you may not necessarily be taking into consideration the different circumstances that are gonna be important for you, uh, which is why I'm a big advocate. I know it's a little self-serving, okay? Cause I'm an attorney that practices in this area, but it, it really is necessary in my opinion to sit down with somebody who understands some of the intricacies involved here to kind of go over, hey, what's it gonna look like to create a unique plan that's right for me, okay? Versus a one size fits all approach that you might get through technology or through templates or something like that. Um, but somebody that knows the issues and can spot those issues and ask some of those hard questions, right? Are you on your second marriage where both spouses have children from a previous relationship? Maybe you're divorced and have uh, a, a life partner. Um, and what's that going to look like when you pass away? Are assets being commingled or is everything kept separately? You know, these sorts of things. Uh, new parents with young kids, parents that have disabled children, uh, one spouse that has a disabled spouse potentially. You know, these are all situations that, that could come up where it's going to require a little bit of nuance. So this is, uh, there, there's really no further text or anything like that to this slide. It's just a, an example I like to highlight. There was a case a while back where um, a, a person was divorced but had never updated the uh, 401k beneficiary designations. Um, and, I, and I think some money ended up going to his stepkids after uh, protracted litigation and things like that. Um, you know, and in Michigan, Michigan law says that when you get divorced, the, your spouse's, uh, your spouse and their family is automatically sort of revoked in a manner of speaking. I'm summarizing obviously, but automatically revoked from, from your estate planning sort of documents, um, including beneficiary designations and stuff like that. Uh, but the problem is that federal law, which totally preempts state law on this issue, says that, no, 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 the plan document for a 401k is what controls what happens to that money. And if the plan document lists beneficiaries, then that's what's going to happen with that money. Not what state law says, not what your will says, not what your trust says, right? So this is just an example. And it happened in real life where, you know, this, this, this uh, family ended up in litigation uh, concerning what's going to happen with this money uh, as a result of a lack of clarity. And somebody that probably didn't sit down with uh, an attorney after a significant life event had occurred that would sort of dictate, hey, we got to sit down and plan through this. Um, so that's just kind of one example. Uh, you know, there's thousands, thousands of examples out there. You know, Aretha Franklin's estate is still ongoing. You know what I mean? How long ago did she pass away? Prince's estate is probably still ongoing. These are two celebrities who I think died with no uh, estate plan in place. So. Uh, there's more examples than just the ones I've talked about here, obviously. And by the way, you don't have to be rich for your relatives to fight over money. Believe me, I've got estates that are well, well under a million dollars where people are fighting um, down to the penny. They want to fight about stuff. So, uh, you know, don't think that just because you have a modest estate doesn't mean people won't fight over it because a lot of this stuff is driven by emotions, not, not good business sense, right? Um, so here's some documents that make up an estate plan. Uh, some things that everybody needs and some things that not everybody necessarily needs, but a will, totally necessary for everybody in my view. Uh, trust, maybe it makes sense, maybe it doesn't. It depends on things like uh, what's your family situation? Do you have potentially disabled beneficiaries? Um, do you have a blended family? Uh, things of that nature. Powers of attorney, these are, I think absolutely necessary for everybody. Uh, and there's two kinds, medical decisions on the one hand, legal and financial decisions on the other hand. You want to be able to folks pick who your decision maker is going to be, not rely on Michigan law or the courts to tell you who your decision maker is going to be. Uh, but with powers of attorney, you get to make those calls. Uh, you can designate who is going to be the guardian for a minor child. So somebody like me with four kids, you know, I want to have a say in uh, who the guardian is going to be if me and my wife pass away. Uh, I don't want to have to worry about you know, my, my parents fighting with my sister and maybe fighting with my in-laws over it. You know what I mean? Um, I want I want me and my wife to get together and make that decision ourselves now while we're competent. Uh, so that's very important. Um, one of the most commonly probated assets is real estate. So nowadays, your bank accounts, your investment accounts, your retirement accounts, most of those things have beneficiary designations on them. 
Okay, your beneficiary designation is pretty much avoid probate. All right, uh, but real estate, not as simple. There's not a there's not a simple one page form that you can call up and get, and you just put somebody's name and, and social security number on there, and boom, when you die, they automatically get the account. Uh, that's not how it works. So you got to do some type of pre planning for your real estate to ensure that that avoids probate, if that's a goal for you. Um, now. What outside of sort of the legal realm are some things that we could talk about here too, right? Because so far all the documents I mentioned are kind of documents that you would usually have prepared by an attorney. Well, uh, life insurance and long-term care insurance, uh, those, are, those are instruments that uh, I don't really have much to do with, frankly, other than maybe helping you interpret them um, potentially or, or helping you interface possibly and facilitate the relationship with the person who sells those sorts of insurance policies. But these are other things to think about and what kind of life insurance is it gonna be? And I find the list a lot with life insurance is that people don't really understand what they're buying. And I've fallen into that trap too, you know? Um, so what kind of life insurance is it? Is it term, is it whole, um, is it convertible? Uh, you know, long-term care insurance is sort of a life insurance product. So uh, do you have one of those sorts of policies? Um, and if you already have that policy, what's the status of it? You know, these, these companies are constantly going out of business and getting bought up by other companies and things like that. And their policies are being transferred over to other companies. So do you have a clear picture of, hey, if I became disabled and needed long-term care, what is my family going to do, right? Do they know where to find this policy? Do they even know I have a policy? You know, these are things that we sit down and talk about. And then, of course, I always run through beneficiary designations with my clients. These are typically not things that I draft. In some cases, I do, but usually not. Usually it's a one pager, a form that you get from your bank or financial institution where you put on there how you want your money to go when you pass and in what percentages, right? And that's going to be, this is the key to remember with beneficiary designations. That's going to be the controlling legal document for the disposition of that account, okay? And it's going to control over what's in the will. It's going to control over what's in your trust. So it's absolutely critical. I'm going to say that again. It's absolutely critical to make sure that those beneficiary designations are coordinated properly with your estate plan. I'll, I'll leave it there on that slide. Um, okay, so I might have said some of this already, but uh, the will is a probate document. So if you are trying to avoid probate, you will need to do something other than just have a will. Um, by the way, there's nothing wrong with probate um, necessarily. Some people like to avoid it for maybe privacy reasons or something like that. Uh, because, of course, any court filing will typically be a public record. Um, but probate administrative process is very similar to the trust administration process. Uh, but, you know, we could sit down and probably have an hour discussion on to, whether to avoid probate and how to avoid probate. But let it, let's leave it here for now that a will will not accomplish that if that's your goal. Okay. This document will say what happens with your stuff when you pass away. It could say, but it won't necessarily uh, who's going to take care of minor children, and you may include like a funeral representative designation for who's going to handle your funeral and burial arrangements. That also could go in a power of attorney sort of document here. That's the basics of a will. Jacqueline, before I before I uh, continue on here, I know that no no keep yeah you can go to the next slide. I just want to know how I'm doing on time here. Do I need to speed it up, slow it down? Um, I want to make you're, sure I leave plenty of time for doing, questions and all that. You're doing fantastic on time. And I think that's okay, great because I'm nice. sure people will have questions at the end. So we're perfect. Okay. I hope I hope for I hope for tons and tons of questions and hopefully nobody stumps me because I'll make you look bad. I don't want that. So, no, no. Okay. <laughs> all right. So trust. Um, so trust is typically a non-probate document. So usually a trust is not going to be filed with the probate court. Um but it needs to be done in coordination with the will. So if you have a will, you don't necessarily need a trust, but if you have a trust, you must have a will. Uh, and there's a reason for that that I might get into in a little bit. So generally a non-probate document. And so usually it's something that's occurring outside of a court, any type of court supervision. Now here's the, here's the main, I think probably I'll say this is the number one problem that my clients have with the trust is that they're not thinking about it the right way. Okay, they come to me, uh, and they pay for a trust and I do it and I talk to them about it and I give them instructions on what to do next. Um, and a lot of them don't follow those instructions, okay? So you can think of a trust much like an empty box in a sense, okay? And so 
if at the end of your life, you take your box and you, and you hand it off to your kids and say, I've prepared this box for you. It's got all my stuff in it. Here it is. And then they open the box and there's nothing in the box. Oh my gosh, what happened? Well, you didn't put anything in it. <laughs> you got to take the steps to put things in the box, right? In the trust has to hold title to assets in order for it to really be effective in passing on your stuff to your, to your children. And by the same token, if you have a trust and you think that, oh, the trustee is kind of like uh, an agent that can manage my assets to the extent I'm laid up in a nursing home somewhere, now they're going to be able to step in and manage the, the stuff for me so I don't have to do it myself. And they look in the box and if there's nothing in there, uh, now they got to rely on the powers of attorney to, to do it because it's not in the trust. So really important um, to make sure that the trust is what we call funded. And that's, that's the process, the legal term for putting stuff in the box, right? It's funded. Okay. Um, for 99% of people, maybe 90% of people, I don't know, uh, state taxes are not going to be an issue, at least not right now. Um, at the end of, I think, 2025, uh, it's going to be an issue for slightly more people, but still not very many. Um, so stay tuned on that. There's always legal updates and stuff, but currently not a problem for most people. Um, the interesting thing about a trust is that a will only takes effect after you die. A trust is effective during your lifetime also. So a trust can provide for lifetime management of assets and also then post-death distribution of assets. The other nice thing about a trust is that it provides uh, a great, great deal of flexibility for the ongoing management of assets even after death for the benefit of the beneficiaries. And this could be advantageous in many, many different cases. You might have, for example, a child who you know that if you gave them $100,000, they would run down to Greek town and throw it all on black, okay? And we don't want that. So instead we're gonna say, hey, trustee, you're gonna hold on to this money and you're gonna use it in the best interest of that beneficiary, but we're not gonna just give it to them outright, okay? Um, Another, another uh, thing to consider there would be for those of us that have uh, children or, or other loved ones that may be on some form of government benefits, okay? If you, and I had this happen, um, a, a gentleman left his two daughters 50% of uh, his money, okay? The one daughter, not an issue. The other daughter uh, is on government benefits, okay? And so receiving that money resulted in her disqualification from government benefits because they were means-tested benefits. A means-tested benefit is one where the government uh, adds up all your assets to determine whether or not you qualify, okay? So you can think of it as a needs-based benefit, right? Something that you need based on your levels of income and assets, all right? So what we had to do in that case was create a first-party special needs trust, which means that the daughter that received the money that was on benefits could remain eligible for those benefits, but we put it in a special needs trust for her, Okay. Now the downside to the first party special needs trust is that when she passes away, uh, anything that's left in the trust can get clawed back by the government to repay for those benefits. Okay. If on the other hand, the dad had created a third party special needs trust uh, in his own estate documents, then that money would not necessarily uh, go back to the state to repay for those benefits. Okay. So this is why it's important to do the planning in advance to think about ahead of time, what sorts of conditions are my kids or other beneficiaries laboring under? What do we need to think about here? Again, an attorney can sit down with you and ask those questions, but you know, if you're just on the internet screwing around or, or being a DIYer, you're not necessarily gonna think of that stuff. You're not gonna ask those questions of yourself. And so that's why it's important to get somebody else involved there. Um, Jacqueline, I know we talked about a number of different things, I think with this slide. So if there's anything uh, that I should go into here that I missed just now, um, if you could remind me, that'd be great. Otherwise, I'll just move along. I think that um, Robin had asked you a question when we did the run through, and I can't remember yeah. how Robin asked it. I'm, I'm probably calling her to be on the spot, but it was regarding setting no, up no, that's okay. a trust or mm -hmm. uh, special needs and mm -hmm. then also like yeah, so that's okay. I, I think it's coming back to me. I think okay. I think one of the things we had talked about was, you know, who's going to be the trustee or who should be the trustee. Um, yes. I don't remember if she asked that directly, but I certainly talked about that. I think, um, and and so this is an important decision. Uh, you, and I'll just define that term real quick. The trustee is like the executor, right? So that's the person that's managing the assets uh, on behalf of the beneficiaries. 
So when you name somebody a trustee, they're entitled to reasonable compensation for their services as trustee, but they're not entitled to receive principal distributions from the estate by any means, okay? So the trustee stands in that fiduciary relationship of managing those assets and determining when and how much to make in distributions. So with regards specifically to a special needs trust, it's very important to select a trustee who A, is going to care about that beneficiary and care about their well-being, um, but then also has some sort of knowledge and understanding of what sort of distributions will be appropriate from a legal standpoint, okay? Because just because you got the money in a trust, once you start making distributions, okay, once it hits the beneficiary's bank account, now it counts for them, okay? Now the government can come and say, okay, now you've got too much money, you're disqualified, right? So the trustee will have to be very careful about deciding how to make those distributions. And maybe the way to do it is you make the distribution directly for the payment of a certain expense rather than giving the money to the beneficiary. But, you know, this is like way outside the scope of this presentation to go into the minutia of every different government program and what sort of uh, distributions are appropriate or not appropriate for that. Um, but suffice it to say that this is a case where a professional trustee or a corporate trustee um, may be a good idea, at least as a co-trustee, because you could have more than one person do it. So a lot of clients, they want family members involved. So they want, hey, uh, I want Brandon to be the trustee for disabled brother, right? Or disabled sister or disabled grandchild, okay? And that might be fine, but Brandon might not necessarily know uh, or be familiar with all the rules and regulations surrounding these government benefits, right? So Brandon may need a co-trustee who is a professional, maybe an attorney or maybe a trust company or something like that, who could kind of sort of balance out um, maybe the lack of professional experience and knowledge that the family member trustee has. So, and if certainly if Robin has more questions on that or if I missed the main question, uh, I welcome that at the end, of course. So power of attorney, legal and financial decisions, all right? Almost speaks for itself, but we're talking about things like buying and selling real estate, signing contracts, writing checks, um, you're designating an agent through this document to act on your behalf. So this could be somebody who needs to interface with the insurance company on something. Um, you know, if you've got that long-term care insurance policy, uh, who is going to be authorized to call the insurance company and say, hey, I need to make a claim. Send me the claim form. You know, I, I don't know. They might not necessarily just send it to anybody without some type of authorization, right? Um, and that's the case in a lot of circumstances, not just with life insurance or long-term care insurance either, but with other forms of insurance and in terms of making investment decisions about your investment accounts and things like that. Uh, these are things where you need to designate uh, a legal or financial representative to be able to do that. There's huge amounts of flexibility with this document. Um, it could be effective immediately. Uh, I, and I, I find that most frequently with um, sort of the more aged and elderly sort of clients or the people that are already um, somewhat incapacitated, but they still have their mental faculties about them and uh, they want to designate somebody that can act immediately. Uh, and then also there could be a situation where maybe, hey, you know what, I don't really feel comfortable with that. I would rather have somebody that only could act for me in case of an incapacity or disability, in which case we then have to have a conversation about, hey, well, who determines if you're disabled? or incapacitated, right? Is it two doctors? Is it a panel of people uh, that you designate and have decided, no, these people can make that decision? Is it just one person uh, that can make that decision? And again, you know, and then what do we mean by incapacity or disability, right? Because just because somebody's in a wheelchair, uh, which could be seen, of course, as a physical disability, that doesn't mean they're not competent to handle their own affairs, right? So we've just got to be very careful about how we define our terms here. Um, and the way that it typically shakes out in, in my world is it tends to be the case that you would have doctors making the decision that, you know what, this person, yeah, their, their incapacity is to the level now where they can't handle their own affairs, right? Uh, but there's many different ways to skin that cat, so to speak. So, um, you know, I'll leave it there for now. Uh, but it does avoid the family having to seek a conservatorship in most cases, so. Uh, that's one of the one of the other primary advantages there. Um, now you got medical and healthcare decisions, right? So in Michigan, we call this a patient advocate designation very commonly. 
Um, a lot of times this is incorporated with like a living will, uh, as you may have heard, or um, I'm trying to remember some of the other terms that you have, but this is where you can declare, hey, these are my intentions for if I'm getting towards the end of life or if I have a terminal condition or a significant illness or something like that, this is the sort of care that I want or don't want. And these are the sort of abilities that I want my patient advocate to have. And so this is something that can be as generic as you want it to be. And you say, hey, I'm giving my patient advocate broad discretion to make all these decisions. Or it could be something that's a little bit more uh, nuanced than that. Well, you know what? If I have this condition or that condition, then I want the maximum treatment possible. But if I have these other conditions, you know, I want, uh, I want a little bit more discretion to be advisable there to sort of uh, keep me comfortable, but allow me to pass naturally sort of thing. Um, so these are hard discussions to have and it's difficult to decide who's gonna be the one to make these decisions, uh, but also very, very important because it avoids the family having to go through the guardianship procedures with the courts, okay? And it allows you to say, hey, this is what I want. When you put your decisions in writing, it makes it much, much more likely that somebody's actually going to follow that, right? And avoid things like probate litigation concerning uh, your end of life care. So these are decisions related to, you can just leave it there, that's fine. Care, custody, and control, so those medical decisions, your health care, your mental health care, your physical custody of your person, and control over uh, sort of your environment and health care and stuff like that. Um, we talked a little bit about beneficiary designations already. This is kind of the next phase, okay, of that discussion. Also to include joint ownership. I find a lot of people putting kids, their kids on accounts, especially as they get older, they think, hey, I want somebody to be able to write checks out of this account. I'm gonna put my kid on there. Okay, if you only have one kid and if they're probably gonna outlive you, um, maybe not a terrible idea. I'm not a huge fan of it because you're giving up ownership, right? You're not. You're not just providing access, now you're giving up ownership too. So that would have possible consequences if you are going to go on long-term uh, government assistance, right? So like Medicaid for long-term care. Uh, Medicaid will view that joint ownership possibly as a divestment of one half of the value of the asset, uh, which could incur penalties there. So that's not a good thing, okay? Uh, the other thing is you've given up control. So if they go and clean the account out, uh, there's really no clear, um, I mean, you could certainly make a claim uh, or make an argument legally that they were sort of acting in a fiduciary capacity rather than an ownership capacity, but the waters are muddied now. It's been commingled. I don't like it. Um, but what you could do instead is powers of attorney and, and trusts and things like that, uh, that would have more clear lines of, of responsibility and accountability. Uh, next, okay, so say you've designated your child, one child out of out of maybe two or more, okay, we'll say one out of two or more. Um, and you pick the one that's the most financially responsible and that you have confidence will do the right thing and you put them on there as a joint owner, now you die. Legally, that, that child has now become the sole owner of that account. And so whether or not they are going to split the money up like you told them to, I mean, I don't know if that's gonna happen, you know? And so that's the problem with just kind of picking one person to receive all of it. And then you just sort of have to trust that now that mom or dad's gone or, or you know, it doesn't even necessarily have to be a child, but now that, now that the principal is gone, that they're gonna do the right thing and there's no clear accountability there. Um, so there's lots of disputes over so-called convenience accounts that were set up jointly, but there's nothing in writing that suggests that this is just for convenience sake, you know? So that's a huge problem. Uh, I don't like it. There's a lot of litigation over joint accounts. And again, I'm telling you, these do not have to be large sums of money for people to fight about. People will fight over ten or twenty thousand um, dollars, or maybe even less. So, so please don't think that if you have a modest estate that people aren't going to fight over it. Because I'm telling you, they absolutely will. And even if they get along now, the, the whole family dynamic changes once mom and dad pass away. Um, you know, the whole family dynamic changes. So, uh, definitely, definitely advisable to consult an attorney uh, before just you know, making a joint account designation like that. Uh, we talked about the effect of a transfer on death or pay on death beneficiary designation. Again, just with these things, there's no way to assure proper asset distribution um, unless you put it in writing in some type of legal, legally binding document. So some people will just pick one kid and leave them as the beneficiary. And then that kid is trusted to distribute things to everybody else. No way to guarantee that, no accountability there. 
Um, so, you know, please think long and hard and consult with an attorney before you make a decision like that. Um, and then the other issue with joint ownership is taxable gift issues. There's also an issue with pan death designations. So I've, I've never heard of this happening, but I could certainly imagine that it would potentially. Um, currently the, the, the gift uh, tax exemption amount is like $16,000 or something like that. Um, so you can give up to 16K uh, without gift tax a liability being incurred, okay, per year. Um, so if you, have a, if you have an account that's say 50,000, maybe it's a savings account, and you put a child on there as the joint owner, uh, have you just made a $25,000 gift because it's half the account value? And then is the amount that's over the exemption a uh, taxable gift? Now, if nobody finds out about this, it's never going to be a problem, right? But uh, I don't know. They just hired like 500 auditors or 1,000 auditors or whatever with the IRS. So I'm not sure what they're going to do with all that. But, um, you know, it's certainly possible that that could be considered a taxable gift. And similarly, with the child that inherits uh, all of it through a death uh, designation, a beneficiary designation, and then gives that money away to his siblings, uh, is that a taxable gift? You know, again, um, I think there's arguments to be had both ways there. And the easiest way to do it is just do it the right way in the first place uh, without having to create these issues after the fact and then try and fix them later. Okay, so hopefully we're getting towards the end here and I'm not boring everybody uh, completely to tears. Um, I know I'm getting tired of listening to myself talk, so I imagine you must be too. Uh, but the, the end game here is to have a personal uh, plan and meet your goals, gives you peace of mind, uh, number one, you want to live out all of your days with dignity. And I think the best way to do that is to make sure that your wishes and your desires is all set out in writing in a legally sort of binding fashion, and then plan for the transition of your assets. Once you pass away, make sure all your stuff goes where it's supposed to go, that there's no ambiguity there. Uh, that's the bottom line. That's the end goal here with estate planning. Okay, now we finally reached the point where I'll let somebody else talk. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Brandon. This was very informative. Please feel free um, if you, I have a hand raised by Robin. Go ahead, Robin, and, and you can raise your hand or if you want to type in the chat box, whatever is most uh, efficient for you. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for the presentation, Brandon. It was definitely not boring. It was very, um, very beneficial. Um, okay, I'm trying to remember <laughs> my questions. Um, oh, <sighs> the first question I had was, I have a, I have a special needs trust because I'm on benefits and my mother would like me to, to leave me her home when she passes but I can't have that big of an asset. So that's why we did it. We put it in that box. My trustee is, is a good friend of mine who I will work with. Um, and I know a lot about the, the laws around these benefits and like, I have a lot of that knowledge, but should I, like do something to pr better prepare her for what she would be asked to do as the trustee? Yeah, so sorry, I, I muted myself there and then I was like kind of wrestling with that uh, with my mouse for a second there. Um, yeah, so I mean, here's the thing from her perspective, okay? Um, as the trustee, so a trustee is a fiduciary and has fiduciary obligations, okay? Um, and is obligated to act in the best interest of the beneficiary. Now, if the trustee makes a bonehead move that an educated person, an educated trustee would have known better, okay? Then, yeah, that could be a big problem for her. So I think, or, or him, I suppose I shouldn't assume, but, um, so I think that could be a big problem for that trustee. And so they, they would want to be educated uh, to the greatest extent possible so as to be able to live up to that fiduciary responsibility. Now, you 
uh, to maybe be a great resource in that regard. But the caution would be that you are a beneficiary. Um, you don't necessarily owe the trustee the obligation. That person owes you the obligation, right? Right. So while I think it's awesome and, and certainly commendable that you have all that knowledge and can share that knowledge, it's ultimately going to be the trustee's responsibility to make right. sure that they know what they're doing. Um, right. So, yeah, I think uh, some further education absolutely could be could be called for in a situation like that. Also, when sorry, and, and I'm sorry, just to interrupt for one second, that's also for her for, for your trustee, for your friend's trustees benefit and protection, too, where they can they can say, hey, look, I'm keeping a, a running journal of all the trainings that I've done on this. And so if something does happen. They can say, hey, uh, I made the I made the best decision that I could at the time, given the information that was available and based on this record of training that I have. And, and I think that that would certainly be something because, Robin, you don't know um, and no beneficiary knows uh, what the future is going to hold for whatever situation you're in. Right. Now, it may be the case that you're that, uh, you know, if you have a disability, it's not necessarily going to get any worse, but there could be something else that comes up, right, that then uh, creates an issue where you're unable to participate in your own sort of decision making. And now it's all up to the trustee. And how are they going to protect those benefits and protect you and, and do what's best for you? So, uh, and I'll leave it there. Uh, the, my second question was, not really a question, but it, you said on the um, power of attorney slide that someone could avoid um, the, the, the task of guardianship by having figured out the power of attorney that helps to avoid that. I, I know some parents of children with cognitive or developmental disabilities that would need help with certain decisions and writing checks, you know, signing medical forms, that kind of thing, but they were able to avoid guardianship by doing the power of attorney, which gives that individual more, more independence over their own life, but it also safeguards mm -hmm. them. So I just wanted to mention that I'd heard of that. No, well. and I appreciate you. I appreciate you mentioning that. I've encountered that before plenty of times. Um, and I think I think the important thing for people to understand that parents don't always understand. Excuse me one second. <clears throat> ah, a little tickle there. Um, so the important thing to understand that parents don't always understand is that with a child that has a cognitive impairment, right? But they're maybe they're 18, 19, 20, or or 50, who knows? Um, that doesn't per se mean that the child lacks capacity to make his or her own decision, okay? Um, the capacity to enter into a legal document or sign a legal instrument such as a power of attorney, and I'm summarizing, you know, legal principles here, but the, the basic capacity required is, is, do they understand the nature of the document and the effect of signing it, right? And so, you know, if somebody has a first grade uh, level of, of reasoning, and a document is drafted in such a way as to be understandable to a first grader, um, then possibly, yes, they can, even with the first grader's understanding of the world, uh, sign and make a legally valid decision to designate somebody as power of attorney. Um, this gets into a sticky legal question of who is the client, right? Because if parents come to me and say, I'm the client, I want guardianship, I can certainly present the option to them of, have you thought about a power of attorney? But if they insist on a course of action uh, involving a guardianship and the parent is the client, then now I'm retained to do a guardianship and the child may not want it or may not really understand what's going on, uh, but now I'm retained by the parents to do that, right? And so as the attorney, I don't always necessarily have control over that. I can, I can educate the parents in that uh, regard, um, but it's not, always, uh, it's, it's not always something that I as the attorney get to control. Ultimately the client 
is going to decide what course of action they want to take. And there are a number of reasons for, for as the parent, why you want a guardianship versus why you want your child to be able to make that decision themselves. Um, and I won't get into all that here, but uh, those conversations have taken place. And we've drafted documents at times that are powers of attorney, but that are very um, plain in terms of the language used so that they can be more easily understood by somebody who have diminished uh, understanding. Thanks, uh, Robin, for those questions and, and statements. And thanks, Brandon. Th that was, those are very, very good points. Um, I see Michael Harris has his hand up. You have a question, Michael? Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, Brandon, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, uh, I'm just a few questions, really. How often should you, once you have a trust in a will, have it reviewed? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think I'm a big proponent of, I think every year you got to dust it off and read it. Okay, because I know, I know what happens. Okay, you get the stuff done, you throw it in your drawer. All right, and you don't do anything with it. You don't think about it ever again. And I've got clients that come to me that had their stuff done at, at this law firm 25 years ago or whatever. And, uh, you know, they're, they just dust, they're just now dusting it off and, and looking it over. All right. Um, and that's fine because they're, they're competent and, and still capable of signing amendments and things like that. Uh, but you got to dust it off and read it yourself every, every year or every two years or so. Um, as far as when should it be updated, you know, it depends on when the law changes. So I think probably a good rule of thumb is every three years you, you have a sit down uh, with your attorney and say, okay, does this still make sense? All right, um, based on everything that's going on in my life. Now, here's the, here's the caveat to that. If you have a significant life change, then it doesn't matter if you just signed all that stuff yesterday, you gotta come back and have that life change addressed. And that could be a death in the family, a divorce, um, a, new, a new child was born, somebody who was previously not disabled has now become disabled. Uh, your child has a, a drug or alcohol problem now that they didn't have before. And you, you, know, you wanna make sure you account for that properly in the planning documents, you know, all sorts of different things. Any major life change, you wanna at least pick up the phone and say, hey, what do I do here? Do I, do I make changes here or not? You know, so some of it depends on circumstances. Yeah, every three years, have that conversation. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to make changes, but you should at least have that conversation every every few years. Okay, and on the special needs trust, let's say, give, I'll give you a hypothetical. Uh, let's say, in my case, I leave my assets to my sister who's on Social Security and Medicaid, and I don't, and I I, I don't uh, really uh, take the time to come up with a special needs trust. Is the person, if I leave the assets, are they obligated by law to, to take them, even if it might benefit their benefits? Um, so there's kind of two questions there. So no, you are not obligated by law to take custody of those assets. You could uh, file what's called a disclaimer uh, and disclaim the inheritance, in which case the inheritance passes as though you had predeceased. The, uh, the, I guess in this case it'd be you, um, but as though they predeceased the testator, we'll call them. Um, but so yeah, you can do that. And there's a lot of different reasons why you might wanna do that. Uh, the problem is that most government programs will impute those assets to you regardless um, because you had access to and control over whether you received them. And so that will still be imputed to you what we would typically do as a solution in that case is we would have the beneficiary receive the assets, and then we would have the court enter a protective order to create a first party special needs trust to hold those assets to protect the government benefits. Uh, but understanding that at the end of that beneficiary's lifetime, if there's still assets remaining, the government will be able to claw back that amount um, to, to you know, offset the amount that was spent on the government benefits. And that only applies in the case of a means tested or a needs based benefit. If it's an entitlement where it doesn't matter how much your assets are, then there's a different analysis there. Okay. And what would the, let's say hypothetically, again, you have to go through this process to resolve this. Are we talking six months to a year? 
Um, I mean, yeah, minimum pretty much for any probate process, I'd say six months so, a year. For that's sure. why it's important that families then take the time to do the special needs trust mm -hmm. and not put their. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. Yes. So even with even with uh, even with a special needs trust set up and fully funded and everything, um, there's still, there's still certain notices. Once that trust becomes irrevocable, so typically that would occur when the person who created the trust dies. So if I'm creating a special needs trust for my son, okay, and I die, now that special needs trust becomes irrevocable, okay. And once that occurs, there's certain notices that have to be sent out. So as the settler of a revocable trust, now that it's irrevocable, I got a published notice in the, in the legal news in the county in which I reside that creditors of mine as the dead guy have four months to make claims against the trust property. And if they don't make those claims within that four month period, you can forget about them. But so there's typically at least a four month period, uh, even with a trust, right? And, and sometimes longer. So yeah, I would, I would say that uh, there's a waiting period no matter what, but certainly it can drag on even longer with probate because, you know, you file something today. Well, the court might not really receive that for four to six weeks in Wayne County. Uh, they can be backed up up to two months. Uh, I think you've got some personal experience with that as do I. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's not a great scenario, um, especially when you're dealing with a very, very busy probate court like Wayne County. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And, uh, like I said, Brandon, thanks for, 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 uh, great job. Yeah, thank you so much. Does anyone else have any other questions right now? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Um, so I'm just going to take this opportunity to, again, thank Brandon so much. Brandon, this was huge. We've We've done several webinars, and this one, you know, I have to say that our whole team really learned a lot from some of the other webinars are, you know, we've talked about accessibility issues. Those are all our bread and butter. This, this really, we all took away, every team member took a, uh, something away from this. So um, you did a fantastic job and I hope all of the attendees today um, took away something. Um, I just want to remind everyone again that we are going to be um, uploading up. this to uh, our, our cloud and um, and then we will download it to our YouTube and share it uh, with all of you. Yeah. Um, and we'll be sharing it on our social media page. Uh, if you um, have any questions, you can email me. My email is jcoaches at michiganpda.org. And I'm going to take you quickly back to the screen where I think it's listed. Um, Yes, right there with my very, very old photo. <laughs> I need to update. That is a 15-year-old photo of me. I do not look like that anymore. <laughs> but uh, please feel free to email me directly. Um, hang tight um, as the, the content usually takes about a, a couple hours to upload. So it might not be tomorrow until you receive the email with the link from uh, the recording uh, today. But um, I just, again, want to thank you all for joining us and specifically thank Brandon. Like this was tremendous for us to learn about this and super helpful. Um, before we go, I just want to make sure that nobody, I see a chat question. Thank you so much for, oh, that's so awesome. Thank you, Debbie. We appreciate it. Does anyone else have any questions before we go? Uh, I think I, I have one say, question. Uh, Oh, sorry. sorry I ahead. don't know where the hand is. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Okay. That's okay. So, Go ahead. Yeah, I see. Um, okay. Even if I, I had a question, even if you have a trust, then it once it becomes irrevo irrevocable, it still goes through probate. No, um, not necessarily. So what what happens um, in a trust administration is once a revocable trust becomes irrevocable, that usually occurs on the death of the trust creator. Uh, the trustee has uh, 63 days to uh, send notice to all the trust beneficiaries concerning there was a trust, I'm the trustee, here's the provisions of the trust that affect your interests. And if it's you know registered with the court or something, which usually they're not, you have to notify them of that. And there's some other statutory things you have to say, like if you want to contest the validity of the trust, you have six months or a year uh, from the date of the notice to do that. So it's really important to send out notices like that because you limit the possibility of somebody coming back later and filing some type of litigation because you can say, hey, look, we sent the statutory notice. That means you only get six months to contest the validity of the trust, right? Um, so you got to do stuff like that. And then you got to publish notice in the legal news 
for creditors. Uh, so you'd say, you know, Mrs. Green passed away. And uh, if you were a creditor of hers, then you've got four months to file from the date of the notice to, to send the trustee a claim, right? And anybody that doesn't send those claims in uh, is, is pretty much, they're, they're, they're barred and they can be denied um, at that point. So really important to do that because a lot of people do die with debt. Um, but in a lot of cases, creditors don't, don't respond to these notices. If it's a known creditor, you gotta send them an individualized notice. But a lot of times they don't respond. And if they don't respond, you can just deny the claims. So in a lot of cases, you end up being able to cut the amount of claims that the estate owes uh, or the trust owes by 50% or more um, just, by, just by doing that. So uh, that's pretty, pretty critical to do. But no, it's not necessary to do that through probate court. It's just a, a, a legal um, obligation of the trustee that occurs outside of the court. And this actually highlights one of the reasons why it's so important to, just because you have a trust and just because it's not in court, still really important to have an attorney involved that knows uh, the process or a trustee, a professional trustee that knows what they're doing would be the alternative there um, because you wanna make sure these notices get out there. Uh, otherwise, somebody can come back later and make claims that otherwise you could deny potentially. Um, whereas with probate, the advantage there is that you're in court and everybody thinks like, well, I'm in court, so I need an attorney. Okay, well, that results in things oftentimes being done properly. And sometimes with trust, things are done improperly for the reason that the trustee feels like they don't necessarily need an attorney. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you. That was a really good question. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna take one last shot. Any other questions? So I did just wanna make a comment real quick if I can. I, I just wanna really thank uh, MPVA for having me on here. I wanna thank everybody that attended and listening and all the really good questions that I got. Um, I really enjoy and like doing stuff like this. and and trying to get out there into the community. I don't do it as much anymore as I used to, but I really enjoy doing it. So um, if anybody has questions, I think my uh, email and stuff is here. You can feel free to send me uh, questions or if, uh, you know, Michael or Jacqueline, if there's future events uh, that you need a speaker for, I'm always happy to do more. So uh, just really appreciate it and I'm grateful for the opportunity. So thank you. Thank you, Brandon. It shows that you like doing it. Um, you're very personable in your delivery and you make things that are quite complicated, pretty easy to understand. So thank you so, so much. We really appreciate you taking the time to do this for us. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of the week. Stay warm uh, wherever you are. We here in Michigan by our chapter, we are freezing cold with lots of snow. So <laughs> stay warm. If, if you're here in Michigan listening, uh, have a great rest of the week and stay tuned for an email with the complete uh, presentation being sent to you. Have a wonderful day. Thanks so much.